Okay, so um, this is uh, the plan in terms of, uh, I'll give you a little overview of the disease, what the clinical disease looks like. I would like to talk to you uh, five minutes or so on what the mechanisms of uh, septic shock are, because I think it helps you in terms of uh, treating patients. Um, and then I'm going to go through six broad therapies that uh, are the major therapies we use, early antibiotics, ICU support, goal-directed therapy, corticosteroids and septic shock, activated protein C, and insulin. And again, I'm going to do my best to show you the studies so you have a feel for it, but then give you some concluding uh, comments and conclusions. Uh, then uh, very briefly, a little bit about future directions, and then as I mentioned, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the guidelines. Okay, sepsis and septic shock have been increasing in incidence uh, for since the 1930s. The causative organisms, as you all know, gram-negative, gram-positive, and fungi. Uh, in the large multicenter trials, gram-negatives actually have slipped to the minority and gram-positives now have become uh, 50% or more of the bugs that are isolated from uh, sterile sites. Septic shock is the most common cause of death in non-coronary intensive care units, 800,000 bouts of severe sepsis, uh, 400,000 cases of shock due to sepsis, and 200,000 uh, deaths. Uh, just by way of comparison, uh, myocardial infarction produces about 200,000 deaths a year in the United States. So this is a disease that kills a large number of people, unfortunately. Uh, it doesn't get the same type of uh, kind of immediate uh, care that, uh, that we uh, uh, provide for myocardial infarction. And probably we should, because it turns out that this disease is time-dependent particularly when the patient becomes hypotensive. When they become hypotensive, uh, it, it, within minutes, if you can uh, give them the appropriate antibiotics, the appropriate fluids, uh, that probably makes a big difference to their subsequent survival. The death rate depends on the underlying disease and also the Apache score, the severity of illness, uh, uh, sepsis uh, in a mild form, mortality around 30%. Shock due to sepsis, the mortality somewhere around 50 or 60%. So average is about 50% or so. This is data from the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, 2003, uh, that uh, uh, looked at men and women and the uh, population adjustment incidence of sepsis, you can see that uh, during this uh, 20-year period, uh, it went up. And these are the bugs, uh, gram-negative uh, and gram-positive. And you can see how the gram-positives in about 1987 increased and now are the majority of uh, causes of uh, uh, this was uh, sepsis in the United States. Gram positives, uh, uh, 40%, uh, excuse me, gram positives, 50, gram negatives, 40, and fungi, 10 to 20. Depends on what type of hospital you have. If you do a lot of uh, transplantation, a lot of cancer chemotherapy, fungi may be higher. Uh, and if you don't do those types of things, you, your fungi may be lower. The hemodynamics of sepsis are hypotension with a normal or high cardiac output. There's a vascular dysfunction that uh, produces hypotension, vasodilatation, and uh, a decrease in systemic vascular resistance. And then there's a myocardial dysfunction with a decrease in ejection fraction, uh, left ventricular uh, dilatation. It's a mild dilatation, but it does occur to presumably preserve the stroke volume and the cardiac output. This occurs over a 24 to 48 hour period and then is a reversible phenomenology. We talked about this yesterday, the different forms of shock. This is the weil schubin classification of shock first suggested by uh, uh, Weil and Schubin back in the late 1950s. And septic shock is over here as the prototypic example of, uh, of distributive shock where you get a uh, decrease in preload that we handle with fluids, uh, 
myocardial depression that usually doesn't become the major abnormality, but the decrease in systemic vascular resistance leading to the low mean arterial pressure as the major abnormality that we see in these patients and the shock syndrome. Cardiac output, as I mentioned, is usually normal or elevated. Pathogenesis of septic shock. Uh, I showed you the pathogenesis of shock uh, yesterday. Slightly different. Uh, the nidus of infection is an abscess or pneumonia, peritonitis, pyelonephritis, or cellulitis. The organism either uh, grows locally or invades the bloodstream. It can release exotoxins, things like toxic shock syndrome toxin 1 or the toxin A of pseudomonas can get released and produce activation of all of the different host defense mechanisms. You also can get a gut release of endotoxin, and that's also felt to be an important uh, mechanism, particularly in certain types of uh, sepsis and septic shock. And then a number of bugs have a structural component that has also been shown to be able to activate this uh, particular inflammatory response. The tychoic acid antigen on the surface of uh, Staph aureus or the peptidoglycan. And, of course, a lot of the press goes to endotoxin or lipopolysaccharide, which is uh, associated with the cell membrane of the gram-negative bacillus uh, uh, or gram-negative organisms, and it, too, can activate the system. We talked about how the plasma, macrophages, endothelial cells, and neutrophils release a whole host of molecules or activate a whole host of molecules, the complement system, the coagulation system, the kinin system, cytokines, PAF, nitric oxide, the selectins, renin angiotensin system, a number of the leukotrienes and prostaglandins, and then the neutrophils have a big number of uh, molecules that get released, the lysozymes, uh, oxygen-free radicals, and things like a granulocyte colony stimulating factor. This leads to a cellular dysfunction. This cellular dysfunction uh, leads to uh, abnormalities of the uh, membrane receptors, of the membrane channels, of the actin and myosin sliding on one another, of the lysozyme, and of the mitochondria. And you can demonstrate these abnormalities uh, in, uh, in sophisticated studies that have been done uh, in this particular disease. This leads to a cellular dysfunction so that the uh, kidneys and liver, the lungs, the brain, uh, and the heart all become dysfunctional. Some of the cells actually die in some of these tissues, so there's actual necrosis of cells. And then there's programmed cell death, programmed cell death, uh, or apoptosis, uh, that is a significant component in certain types of sepsis and septic shock. Get abnormalities of the vasculature organs and myocardium uh, leading to the shock syndrome. If you have 100 patients with septic shock who come into a good intensive care unit, uh, nowadays about uh, 50 to 60% will recover, 40 to 50% will die either of refractory hypotension or multi-organ system dysfunction. So what does clinical septic shock look like in humans? Uh, the definition of sepsis has been uh, undergone a lot of different committee uh, evaluations, but I think you can summarize it that sepsis is the systemic response to an infection with two or more of the following conditions, and you're familiar with this temperature, heart rate, respiratory rate or white count, and high or low Numbers uh, on the white count uh, and on the temperature are both considered uh, abnormal. In fact, if you have a low temperature with sepsis, you have a higher mortality than if you have a high temperature. Uh, severe sepsis is sepsis associated with organ dysfunction, hypoperfusion, or hypotension. Um, and these are perfusion abnormalities uh, that are occurring with sepsis and they can be manifest by lactic acidosis, oliguria, or an alteration in mental status. That's the definition of severe sepsis. And shock is sepsis with hypotension despite adequate fluids, along with the presence of perfusion abnormalities. 
A lot of these patients uh, are on vasopressors by the time we see them, and vasopressor um, uh, dependence uh, defines uh, somebody who has hypotension and septic shock. So for a few minutes, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what happens to the heart uh, during sepsis. Uh, We did some studies some years ago using a nuclear camera at the bedside and did some scans during septic shock. This is a young man who had six out of six blood cultures positive, and this is his left ventricle during diastole and systole. And uh, we were surprised to see that despite the fact he had a high cardiac output, and a low systemic vascular resistance. He had a depression, uh, stunning, if you will, but this was actually before stunning was, uh, was described, of the left ventricular and right ventricular myocardium. His ejection fraction was 22%. Ten days later, he got better with our therapy, and his ejection fraction went up to 62%, so from 22 to 62% in 10 days, And basically, that type of depression probably occurs in most, if not all, patients during septic shock. This is the original study published by Margaret Parker and myself in the annals, uh, in which the ejection fraction was low and improved over 10 days. To our surprise, uh, survivors seemed to have a lower ejection fraction that came up to normal. Non-survivors didn't have much of a uh, depression of ejection fraction. These are all the numbers. Uh, The other thing that occurred was that the end diastolic and end systolic volumes of the ventricle were increased, and then over a period of time, they came back down to normal. So uh, uh, Fred Ognabeni and I published this study uh, a few years back where we gave fluids to uh, patients who were critically ill but not septic, patients who were septic without shock, and patients during septic shock. This is end diastolic volume index. This is left ventricular stroke work index before and after fluids. And you can see that septic shock produces a a, uh, downward displacement of the starling ventricular function curve, the classical uh, example of uh, myocardial depression. Sepsis produces some of this, But when you go into shock, you get a much uh, more profound form of myocardial depression. So this is just a summary slide. The mean arterial pressure is low during the acute phase of sepsis. The central venous pressure is low. Cardiac output is high. Remember, elevated cardiac output, elevated heart rate, normal stroke volume so that the Uh, Probably the dilatation allows the stroke volume to stay normal, systemic vascular resistance low, ejection fraction low, end diastolic and end systolic volumes mildly, mildly. This is not like somebody with mitral regurgitation or anything. This is just a mild dilatation of the ventricle, but it's there uh, reliably both by nuclear scanning and by echo. Hopefully your patient gets better. Uh, The mean arterial pressure comes up to normal, heart rate comes down, systemic vascular resistance normalizes. You can see the ejection fraction now, instead of being 33%, has come up to 50%, and the size of the ventricle is now normal. So this is uh, hypotension, tachycardia, high output, low resistance, and uh, this data suggested that there's a left and right ventricular uh, depression of ejection fraction, mild ventricular dilatation of both ventricles, and this is a reversible phenomenology in survivors. So what's the mechanism of uh, this cardiovascular dysfunction? Why do these people develop uh, a shock syndrome? Why do they develop hypotension? Uh, One uh, hint toward this was uh, this particular study published by Bob Danner, and myself, in which we did uh, endotoxin assays uh, by alimulus lysate in a group of patients with septic shock who came in consecutively into our intensive care unit. And what we found was that if you had endotoxin in your blood, you had a higher lactate, you had a higher bilirubin, a lower systemic vascular resistance, you needed more pressors, you had more renal insufficiency, more ARDS, and a much higher mortality and you had a 4.8 times more likely to have a low ejection fraction. So endotoxin was uh, linked to a more severe form of sepsis and septic shock. 
We then tried to get an idea of what endotoxin does, how does it produce this, and Anthony Sufredini did this particular study where you give a very tiny dose of endotoxin to a volunteer, and then you do a scan in hemodynamics over an eight-hour period. And what we found was that you get a fever from the endotoxin. This has been studied by uh, Wolf and Fauci uh, some 20 years earlier, you do get a little release of TNF, so you're kind of producing a very mild form of, uh, of probably what happens in a much, much more severe way in spontaneous sepsis. And, in fact, you see some mild myocardial depression that is, in fact, reversible. This is peak systolic pressure over end systolic volume index. It's a load-independent measure of cardiac performance, and these volunteers develop that. So uh, there's a qualitative hemodynamic profile similar to human sepsis, high output, low resistance, reversible depression of LV function, and the conclusion was that endotoxin can serve as a major mediator of sepsis-induced cardiovascular dysfunction. A lot of studies have been done in this field. I'm just trying to give you a feel for the type of studies large and small animal models, cellular and subcellular processes. And again, I'm going to give you a couple of minutes on one study that I think uh, gives you a feel for kind of what's going on during sepsis. This is a mouse model of sepsis. Sergio Zanotti, Steve Hollenberg, and myself did these studies. Uh, the ma mice, mouse is made septic by cecal ligation and puncture, which is a, a uh, abdominal sepsis similar to humans. And we do an echocardiogram. This is an echocardiogram in a mouse. The mouse heart is only about a millimeter and a half in size, so it requires a lot of good imaging. Uh, these are the animals that were used, cecal ligation and puncture. And if you're fortunate and have a lot of good uh, uh, people working with you, they're willing to do an echocardiogram every three to six hours for 72 hours in a in a uh, mouse model of uh, septic shock. Uh, this is what a mouse uh, echocardiogram looks like. Here's the uh, end diastolic volume and systolic volume, and you can get very good images. And what we found was that some of the mice developed a dilated ventricle. It went up by 18%. Some of the mice didn't dilate their ventricle, and uh, it went down by 20%. About a third of the mice dilated their ventricle, two-thirds did not. And this just shows you the dilatation and the non-dilators, and this is uh, in terms of end diastolic volume and stroke volume. And this would be, you know, I think mildly interesting, except for one very important fact, and that is that if you dilate, if you dilate your ventricle and you're a mouse with sepsis, then you live. And if you don't dilate your ventricle, then unfortunately you don't live. Um, so that dilatation was linked very, very closely to survivability. And again, this gets to kind of the way the cardiovascular system responds to this serious uh, uh, infection and septic shock. So in a clinically relevant model of murine sepsis, LV dilatation was associated with a decrease in mortality and it suggested that the dilatation phenotype is strongly associated with preservation of an adequate stroke volume in sepsis. This paper is actually coming out uh, in August in chest. And it argues that the uh, compliance of the ventricle makes a difference. And if you're able to dilate your ventricle uh, and uh, uh, maintain stroke volume, then uh, in those types of mice, and also based on the human data from a couple of years ago, uh, in humans, those are the people who are able to handle their septic shock. And then cellular and subcellular processes have been studied. I'm going to just show you some quick examples here. You can grow heart cells in culture. You can get a single cell ejection fraction. Here is the cell growing in culture. And you can put serum on these cells, and we found that the serum from septic shock patients, in fact, produced myocardial depression. If you took the serum off, the depression went away. This was uh, demonstrated in a JCI paper some years ago that septic shock patients have something circulating that, uh, that causes myocardial depression, that the more depression you get, 
the lower your uh, ejection fraction is by scan, and the more serum you put on the cells, the more myocardial depression you get. So it's dose-dependent. And then Anand Kumar came into our uh, laboratory, and uh, he found that tumor necrosis factor and interleukin-1 were, in fact, responsible for this myocardial depression. And I'm not going to show you all those experiments again. I just wanted to give you an idea of how this works and how a lot of other studies have been done. But TNF and IL-1 and the two together have the ability to uh, activate CNOS and also INOS. Uh, That, in fact, uh, releases nitric oxide. And so nitric oxide, in fact, activates cyclic G. And that has the ability to stop actin and myosin from sliding on one another, and that leads to the heart actually dilating. In addition, there's activation uh, uh, and inhibition of the beta receptor that also occurs, and that's another mechanism. The, The body is never simple. There's always multiple mechanisms. So there's a nitric oxide mechanism, there's a beta adrenergic mechanism, and there's probably a direct calcium channel mechanism as well. Remember that the vessels are very important in septic shock, and there are abnormalities that have been shown in a large number of areas of the, uh, of the uh, vessels. You know you can image the microvasculature now uh, using a uh, technique called uh, side stream dark field imaging. Uh, and this technique, uh, we've used it, and many others have used it in order to get an idea of what... Uh, Uh, is going on during septic shock. And just as an example, this is somebody during the early stages of mild septic shock. You can see that the uh, vessels all look very plump, and they look like they're, in fact, uh, uh, perfusing all of the areas. And then somebody with severe septic shock and hypotension, quite dramatic that the uh, perfusion Density goes way down. So there's microvascular abnormalities, myocardial abnormalities, and all of these uh, play into the, uh, the pathogenesis of sepsis and septic shock. In addition, of course, uh, there are a number of genetic abnormalities, uh, polymorphisms of patients uh, with sepsis and septic shock that make certain patients more susceptible to septic shock and more susceptible to mortality. This is uh, Jean-Paul Murat uh, from France who, uh, who demonstrated a polymorphism for TNF2 uh, that was associated with a higher mortality in sepsis and septic shock. Many studies like this uh, showing polymorphism issues. So that's kind of a quick, the clinical, the pathogenesis. Uh, now let's talk about treatment of sepsis. As I mentioned, I think there are six broad categories. Let's talk about early antibiotics. Are they important? This is taken from a study by Anand Kumar in the uh, uh, animal lab, uh, doing, uh, putting a pellet into a mouse uh, and giving antibiotics. If you uh, don't give antibiotics uh, or you give antibiotics right at the time that you put the, uh, the uh, E. coli-laden uh, pellet into the uh, Uh, peritoneum. In fact, all of the uh, animals survive. If you uh, put the pellet into the uh, uh, peritoneum and don't give any therapy, the the, uh, mice start to die at about 24 hours, and essentially all of them die by 36 hours. What's interesting is that if you delay for six hours, six hours, then the curve is over here. Let's see my... If you delay for 12 hours, then the curve is over here. But then if you delay for 15 hours, you start to lose all the mice. In 18 hours, there's no difference. So it makes an enormous difference to give the antibiotics early. And uh, spurred on by these uh, animal studies, Dr. Kumar published a paper in Critical Care in 2006 that I think is the most highly cited paper published in Critical Care Uh, in the last 10 years. Um, And what it showed was that if you gave, and this is based on about 6,000 patients with septic shock in a database, if you uh, give uh, uh, antibiotics uh, within uh, half an hour, you get an 82% survival. And if you give it within 24 hours, you only get a 10% survival. And you can see as you keep on delaying giving the antibiotics, 
the survival rate goes down and down and down. So giving antibiotics early makes an enormous difference, and we really should try to give the antibiotics within minutes. This doesn't mean writing the order to give the antibiotics. This means the antibiotics actually have to enter the patient's bloodstream. So you have to order it, then the nurse has to give it. Um, And that's what counts, and that's what he looked at here. He looked at when the infusion was completed. Um, So uh, that's really the important part. And he demonstrated that it was different, statistically significantly higher mortality, if you gave it in the second 30 minutes of the first hour than if you gave it in the first 30 minutes. So that uh, you're losing patients as you keep waiting minutes to give antibiotics. Antibiotics and giving them quickly are immensely important, and we really should spend a lot of time making sure it happens fast. Um, uh, Did it make any difference whether or not it was culture positive or culture negative or bacteremia positive or community or nosocomial? It made no difference. Uh, It still was all highly statistically significant. Urinary tract infection, intra-abdominal, didn't make any difference. Uh, All forms of septic shock, once you get hypotensive, once you get hypotensive, you really have minutes to get those antibiotics into the patient. In addition, you want to give them appropriate antibiotics because if you give them inappropriate antibiotics, and there's been a bunch of studies on this. I'm just showing you one study, again, by uh, Anand Kumar. Um, uh, You get a five-fold reduction in survival uh, if you give inappropriate antibiotics, that is, antibiotics to which the bug turns out not to be sensitive, uh, highly statistically significant for all of them. And once again, Uh, culture positive, culture negative. It didn't make any difference whether you were bacteremic, whether it was a community acquired. It didn't make any difference where the infection was, uh, pneumonia, intra-abdominal infection. And it didn't make any difference whether it was gram positive, gram negative, anaerobe, or fungi. All of those infections, it makes a difference. So if you really think somebody's got a fungus, uh, you probably want to start antifungal therapy and you want to start it early. Uh, And again, all of the different bugs uh, still highly statistically significant. So the message is early antibiotics, appropriate antibiotics, and in my judgment, this is one of the most important things we can do well for our patient with septic shock. What about ICU support in terms of treating patients? We've known for some time that uh, giving fluids... uh, that uh, to a wedge pressure of 12 to 15 increases stroke work, stroke volume, and uh, cardiac index uh, equally. Um, uh, This is data from uh, from Eric Rakow from some years ago, and uh, I showed you this data that there is myocardial depression during sepsis. So I think it's worthwhile in people who are difficult to manage and you don't know exactly where you are, I think pulmonary artery catheterization early on to find out where you are is generally useful, and I still uh, use it uh, in, uh, in my patients. Um, question number one, 43-year-old man enters the ICU with septic shock due to E. coli. Initial hemodynamic profile is shown on baseline and then following therapy. The change in hemodynamics is most consistent with which therapy? We're going to show you on the next slide. So the blood pressure goes up, 80 up to 90. Not much change in right atrial pressure, a little increase in right ventricular pressure, increase in pulmonary artery pressure. Pulmonary artery occlusion pressure goes up a little bit. Cardiac output goes down. See that? 8.0 to 6.5. Urine output, however, goes up 60 to 80 and splanchnic blood flow was decreased at baseline, and the splanchnic blood flow gets higher. It gets increased. So our question, which is shown on the next slide, the change in hemodynamics is most consistent with which therapy? High-dose vasopressin, low-dose vasopressin, high-dose dope, low-dose dopamine, or a biventricular assist device? So I'll show you this. If you could answer now, please. 
Okay, so it's a tough question, um, and uh, it uh, uh, is designed to make a point that uh, uh, notice that the cardiac output goes down. Dopamine would make your cardiac output go up, okay? And a biventricular assist device would make your cardiac output go up, okay? So, uh, so those can't be correct. High doses of vasopressin in general will produce uh, a decrease in splanchnic blood flow and do it relatively uh, impressively. Um, when we used to use high dose vasopressin for GI bleeding, you'd get intense vasoconstriction and sometimes in the coronary circulation and, and get myocardial infarction. So the fact that the uh, splanchnic blood flow increases urine output increases, and the cardiac output goes down is typical of low-dose vasopressin. That's the dose that was used in the vasopressin trial that I'm about to uh, show you. Um, so uh, 26% tough question, I think, uh, but I think uh, important uh, issue. So the answer is low-dose vasopressin. So this is, these are the commonly used vasopressors. Dopamine, you know, produces uh, a uh, heart rate and contractility effect that's pretty good. You can take this off now, thanks. Uh, does produce some vasoconstriction at higher dose. Norepinephrine produces intense vasoconstriction but also has a cardiac effect on contractility. Uh, dobutamine produces a contractility effect, uh, usually vasodilatation, and then if we go down to vasopressin, again, I've listed here the 0.01 to 0.04 units per minute. This is the low dose of vasopressin. It produces an intense vasoconstriction. doesn't affect the, uh, the heart uh, at all, but uh, produces in the splanchnic bed an increase in uh, the, uh, uh, the blood flow. Um, just as a, uh, a reminder of uh, earlier lectures, mechanical ventilation, clotting dysfunction, renal replacement therapy, and stress ulcer prophylaxis are important to sepsis and septic shock management. You've had multiple lectures on them, but I just wanted to mention that they are important. So this is the study by James Russell and his colleagues called the VAST trial, vasopressin versus norepinephrine. Uh, and it's actually vasopressin and norepinephrine versus norepinephrine in patients with septic shock. That's actually how the study was done. And the vasopressin was titrated up in order to allow the norepinephrine to go down. Um, and uh, they thought that vasopressin plus norepinephrine would be better uh, than norepinephrine uh, alone. In fact, the final results of the trial were that uh, they were the same Vasopressin added to norepinephrine uh, produced the same mortality as norepinephrine alone. Uh, in a subgroup uh, analysis, oh, I, I want to make the point that this low dose of, uh, of vasopressin doesn't produce an increase in myocardial ischemia and myocardial infarction. I think that's important, uh, whereas the higher dose almost certainly would have. Um, however, they did find that in a subgroup analysis, the less severe septic shock, those who were on a low doses of norepinephrine, uh, I believe it was nine, I'm sorry, 15 uh, mics or under, uh, that, that group did make statistical significance. However, this is, in fact, a subgroup analysis, and therefore uh, you'd have to do another study. I happen to have reviewed this paper and made the point to them, which they agreed with, that they probably thought that the more severe septic shock patients would respond to uh, vasopressin, not the less severe septic shock patients. And they admitted that, in fact, that's why they uh, set out this subgroup analysis. Uh, so this is somewhat paradoxical, uh, but nonetheless uh, something to uh, keep in mind. So low-dose vasopressin plus norepinephrine is equal to norepinephrine alone in septic shock. Low-dose vasopressin plus norepinephrine alone are equally safe in septic shock. Vasopressin plus norepinephrine may, subgroup analysis, decrease mortality compared to norepinephrine alone in the less severe, those requiring norepinephrine at less than 15 mics per minute uh, prior to the onset of, uh, of starting the study. Um, I consider this a hypothesis, and uh, 
if you had a question, I would consider vasoplus and plus norepinephrine equivalent to norepinephrine alone. I did write the editorial on this particular uh, article and uh, did make the point uh, that I made earlier that clinicians don't feel the same sense of urgency to treat septic shock as they do with myocardial infarction, and yet there are a couple of studies that suggest that uh, treating these patients early make a difference, and we're talking about giving early antibiotics, the, uh, the study by Kumar, uh, and giving goal-directed therapy early in the emergency department are both important so that uh, uh, I felt that it's the timing of giving the therapy, it's the timing of goal-directed therapy, the timing of giving antibiotics early that, in fact, uh, makes the major difference. Another study just came out a couple of months ago comparing dopamine to norepinephrine in the treatment of septic shock. Very nice study by Dan DeBacker uh, uh, from Brussels, and Jean-Louis Vincent was the senior author. Uh, they, uh, they looked at 1,700 patients uh, with different forms of shock, and norepinephrine and dopamine were equivalent. So again, an equivalency uh, trial. However, when they did a subgroup analysis, they found that the cardiogenic shock, as I showed you yesterday, subgroup, in fact, looks like it did better with norepinephrine. Once again, I think you have to consider this hypothesis generating, not a definitive finding, but this is probably never going to be done again. So I, I'm thinking that in cardiogenic shock, I probably would re, uh, reach for the norepinephrine first based on this uh, subgroup uh, analysis. However, septic shock, our discussion right now, doesn't make any difference. It doesn't make any difference. So dopamine and or norepinephrine are okay. Now you may say to me, well, but uh, dopamine had a higher incidence of arrhythmias and uh, side effects, but those arrhythmias and side effects didn't produce a significant morbidity or mortality. So therefore, I think dopamine is still legitimate. So in this trial, no significant difference in survival um, uh, between dopamine and norepinephrine. Dopamine was associated with more cardiac arrhythmias, so turn the dose down if you get an arrhythmia, uh, and uh, with a higher mortality among those with cardiogenic shock. So uh, septic shock was, in fact, uh, the same. So what about goal-directed therapy? Uh, let's uh, to a, uh, another question. After a bout of influenza, a 72-year-old woman developed pneumonia with positive blood cultures for Klebs yellow pneumonia, develops respiratory failure with ARDS, intubation, mechanical ventilation, PEEP, uh, and her blood pressure goes down to 60 over 40, and hemodynamic monitoring reveals a high cardiac output, low uh, systemic vascular resistance. Of the following management strategies, all have been shown to improve survival in at least one randomized prospective clinical trial except, so if we could put up the answers on the right side. So which one doesn't have a randomized trial showing that it, in fact, uh, is better than uh, placebo? Uh, Drochicogen alpha, activated protein C, early goal-directed therapy in the emergency department, strict blood glucose control, hydrocortisone, and vasopressor support of a low blood pressure. If you could answer now, please. Okay, so hydrocortisone, uh, you're, you're going with the corticus uh, trial here. Okay, I, I, I see the point. Um, let, me, uh, let me suggest to you that uh, A, B, C, and D, there are at least one trial uh, for all of these that show efficacy compared to placebo. Uh, the Zygris has been shown. Uh, the Rivers study has been shown. Uh, the uh, uh, Vandenberg uh, original study showed that strict blood glucose control, and the Anon study showed that hydrocortisone in severe septic shock was, in fact, efficacious. But we've never had a trial of vasopressors versus no vasopressors uh, because that's not an ethical trial, right? Um, so, therefore, there's never been that trial. Now, there have been trials of dopamine versus norepinephrine, 
but that doesn't tell you whether or not support of a low blood pressure makes a difference. So, but I understand what uh, what's happening uh, here because you're concerned about uh, you know the uh, the uh, hydrocortisone trial, and I'm going to go over that in a minute. I'll tell you my view on that. Okay, so this is the early goal-directed therapy in sepsis and septic shock. All of these trials now have uh, some questions about them, right? Uh, this is uh, uh, all of them uh, came out, and we made uh, guidelines, and now we've got some concerns. Uh, but this trial was done in the emergency department at Henry Ford in Detroit. As you probably know, uh, the patients got into the trial, uh, and uh, they followed CVP, uh, mean arterial pressure and urine output, and basically uh, used a protocol in which they measured uh, the CVP, mean arterial pressure, uh, urine output, SVO2 catheter, uh, and gave therapy uh, based on the uh, SVO2. The therapy that they gave was crystalloid and colloid, vasoactive agents, uh, transfusion of red cells, uh, and uh, inotropic agents, which was dobutamine. One of the criticisms of the trial is which of these many therapies, in fact, made a difference. Uh, the trial showed an extraordinary reduction in mortality, from 46.5% down to 30.5%, uh, and all the different subgroups all went in the same uh, direction. Uh, when you look at the graph, uh, it, uh, it's quite uh, striking, the reduction uh, in mortality. When you look at what might be different, it turns out that in the first six hours, they got a lot more fluid, about five and a half liters of fluid rather than about three and a half liters of fluid. And uh, the uh, goal-directed group got somewhat more red cells, uh, not more vasopressors, and somewhat more dobutamine. Uh, they felt that this was the key, giving fluids early on. These are patients who were put into an emergency department uh, shock room for six hours and then sent to the ICU. So again, early, uh, and just like antibiotics early, I think that's uh, one of the messages. Um, uh, we did a study uh, at uh, Cooper uh, done by Steve Treziak where we tried to see whether if you weren't uh, in a place like Henry Ford, could you in fact uh, in institute uh, a similar uh, protocol. Uh, and basically we were able to do so uh, on the next 40 patients who came into our ICU. And it was in fact associated with a reduction in mortality. This was published in CHEST a couple of years ago. Again, just to make the point that uh, if you want to put this type of a protocol in place, there was a lot of skepticism that you could do this, that you could get an emergency department to work along with an intensive care unit group uh, and, uh, and put it in place other than in special uh, circumstances. Uh, at least uh, another hospital was, uh, was able, in fact, to do this. Okay, so uh, there is a study going on sponsored by the NIH to look at the different components of goal-directed therapy. It's going on right now, and uh, we should have uh, some further data on that uh, in about, uh, the estimate is about uh, 24 months. What about corticosteroids in septic shock? Uh, you're probably aware of one study done by Anon and his colleagues uh, uh, from France uh, looking at uh, steroids versus placebo in a group of patients with septic shock. Um, now, one of the issues to look at here is uh, that uh, uh, this particular group was uh, very sick. Their mortality rate was very high. However, the group that got corticosteroids, in fact, did uh, better, uh, uh, statistically significant at the 0.02 level. Um, uh, then subsequently, Charlie Sprung did a trial of uh, some 500 patients. The Anon study was about 300 patients, 499 patients uh, in this corticus trial. And basically, they did not find a difference in mortality, uh, whether in the group that responded to corticocentropin, uh, uh, which is, as you know, looking for relative adrenal insufficiency. If you had a response to cosentropin, still no difference, and all the patients, no difference. So what do we conclude from this? Well, I, what I conclude from this and what the surviving sepsis campaign concluded from this was that if you have a patient with severe septic shock, 
They're on vasopressor agents, and the vasopressor agents are necessary for the patient, in fact, to have a blood pressure, and they're uh, uh, on norepinephrine or uh, other agents such as that. Uh, That fits more into the Anon group. Uh, in terms of the types of patients. And in that group of patients in our intensive care unit, they would get hydrocortisone. So they would get uh, 50 milligrams of hydrocortisone every six hours uh, uh, for uh, five days. Uh, And we would assume that that person uh, has some relative adrenal insufficiency. On the other hand, in the cortica study, the patients were not quite as ill Uh, There was a lot of patients who had uh, severe sepsis without true shock. And in that situation, the feeling was that hydrocortisone, in fact, does not make a difference. So uh, a matter of severity of disease. What about activated protein C? You're familiar with this particular trial. Gordon Bernard in the prowess study showed that uh, giving uh, uh, George Cogen alpha uh, had a uh, reduction in, uh, in uh, mortality, increase in survival. Uh, it did also have uh, an increase in serious uh, bleeding. Uh, it is an anticoagulant agent, activated protein C, uh, and therefore you have to keep that, uh, that particular fact in mind. Then a subgroup analysis of the, uh, of the patients found that, in fact, all of the uh, improvement in the uh, prowess study was in the patchy third and fourth quartiles. When they did follow-up data, it was in the patients with an Apache score of greater than 25 that, uh, that you saw the improvement in, uh, in uh, mortality, and in the people with a less than 25, there was no improvement in mortality. Based on this, the FDA uh, recommended that patients with severe septic shock with, uh, in general, a Apache score that was high should be uh, considered candidates for drochicogen alpha. Subsequently, a whole bunch of studies, the prowess study showed positive uh, study, then the enhanced study suggested using uh, drochicogen alpha earlier, the address trial in less severe patients, uh, no uh, improvement in, uh, in mortality. Post-operative patients did worse, so that it shouldn't be used in uh, post-operative patients, probably because they bleed more. Pediatric trials showed no benefit, and registries showed higher bleeding, uh, largely because the patients put into the trial were sicker. Uh, I was asked to write the editorial on this particular trial, the ADDRESS uh, trial, and this is my feeling that uh, patients with severe sepsis at a high risk of death, which is what the FDA said, patients in shock requiring vasopressor support and you can't get them off the vasopressors, or those with acute lung injury, respiratory failure on mechanical ventilation due to septic shock, are the patients who are the most likely to benefit from activated protein C. So a small subset of the patients that we see. Finally, insulin. You're aware of the original Vandenberg study published in New England Journal 2001. She showed in largely a cardiac surgical intensive care unit that keeping the blood sugar between 80 and 110, so very strict control, uh, improved survival in the ICU and improved in-hospital survival. Now, these are 96%, 92%, so uh, they're, uh, they're uh, you know, numbers that are uh, good survivals, but nonetheless, uh, glucose controls seem to make a difference. She then published the study in a medical ICU that uh, did not show an improvement in survival, but it showed uh, a uh, improvement in morbidities. Um, and then subsequently, others tried to duplicate her work. Uh, this is the NORCEP trial that actually uh, showed a higher mortality in the group that, uh, that was uh, strictly controlled. Uh, and then subsequently, the NICE sugar study, a very, very big uh, study done of 6,000 patients in Australia, uh, in which they found that intensive blood glucose control actually increased mortality, uh, so that keeping the blood sugar down around 100 or 108 uh, was, in fact, uh, associated with uh, increased mortality. They were able uh, 
uh, to, uh, to control the, uh, the sugar, intensive control, had a uh, mean sugar of 108 versus about 150. Um, and in fact, the 150 mean did better. So that uh, 150 is thought to be where you try, ought to try to be, and that's what the surviving sepsis campaign has now suggested. So under 180 where you'd spill uh, sugar in your urine, but not down around 110, that's felt to be probably producing too much uh, hypoglycemia. Future directions, I just want to make the point that uh, there are a number of anti-endotoxins that are powerful, that are being evaluated now, and I have some hopes for some of them as potential therapies for septic shock in the future. The guidelines are the final thing I want to mention. You know, the, the cardiologists have guidelines essentially for everything now uh, with a large number of guidelines. In critical care, we've got some guidelines for some things, um, and the surviving sepsis campaign has been the major purveyor of guidelines in sepsis and septic shock. Phil Dellinger, who, as, a, as you know, was here, uh, wrote the guidelines in 2004 and then 2008, a revision of the guidelines. 2008, they used the quality of evidence uh, using kind of the A to D randomized control trial and then other factors that uh, they put into their determination of the quality of evidence. And I'm going to just go through quickly uh, the uh, recommendations here. Initial resuscitation for a patient with septic shock, it should start immediately. Um, the resuscitation goals are based on the RIVERS trial uh, using a CVP, mean arterial pressure, urine output. Oxygen SAT is thought to be one of the things that you can use. Uh, and if you don't get uh, a good oxygen SAT, then you can consider, consider, it's not recommended, uh, packed red cells or dobutamine. On the diagnosis, appropriate cultures are recommended. Um, on the antibiotic therapy uh, with the Kumar study, the first hour, try to give the antibiotics within the first hour uh, of the recognizing sepsis and septic shock, and that 1B is based on the uh, Anon, uh, uh, Anon Kumar study. Identification of a source going after a focus of infection is felt to be important in removing intravascular catheters, as Dr. Mazur has talked about. Fluid therapy, crystalloids or colloids are felt to be reasonable, shooting for a CVP of greater than 8 and using fluid challenges. Vasopressors, norepinephrine and dopamine, I still consider these two to be equivalent in septic shock. Uh, they suggest using epinephrine if norepinephrine and dopamine don't get you a reasonable arterial pressure. Some people would use vasopressin instead of, uh, norepine uh, instead of epinephrine, but they felt that epinephrine was a better, uh, I guess, third line. Norepinephrine, dopamine, then they'd go to epinephrine, and then they'd use vasopressin uh, as kind of the fourth uh, agent. Uh, dobutamine for somebody with myocardial dysfunction I think that's reasonable. Uh, consider the use of intravenous hydrocortisone, particularly in patients when hypotension responds poorly to resuscitation and vasopressors, kind of a suggestion of the Anon study. Uh, uh, activated protein C in patients with organ dysfunction and a high risk of death. And we talked about that in Apache score greater than 25. Blood products, they suggest staying around 7 in uh, patients with a stable uh, septic shock um, uh, in the acute stage or with myocardial ischemia, you might run a hemoglobin of higher than that, up around 9. Blood transfusions and platelet transfusions, as we've already talked about. Mechanical ventilation, everything we've talked about, 6 ml per kilo, less than 30 as a plateau pressure, a semi-recumbent position, weaning protocols and spontaneous breathing trial protocols, and a conservative fluid strategy for those with established acute lung injury, as Dr. Ely and Dr. McIntyre talked about, uh, sedation protocols to minimize sedation, Glucose control, uh, now they recommend the 150 as the mean that you should shoot for. 
Renal replacement therapy, uh, intermittent hemodialysis, and CVVH are reasonable. CVVH is better in hemodynamically unstable patients. Don't use bicarbonate uh, in septic shock. Use deep vein thrombosis prophylaxis with low dose, uh, 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 low molecular weight uh, heparin, stress ulcer prophylaxis, and a consideration of limitation of uh, support with the family and patients uh, when you don't think there's a chance the patient will make it. Um, there's been a reduction in mortality over the last 20 to 30 years in sepsis and septic shock. Still have a ways to go, still need uh, more, uh, more research and, uh, and uh, more therapies, but, uh, but uh, we've made some progress. And I think some of our progress, anyway, is due to the therapies we've been uh, talking about. So that's uh, an uh, overview of sepsis and septic shock. We've got about three or four minutes. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for your attention.